thank you, David. So, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, my name is Kirk Detweiler, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And really, uh, as as uh, I guess David mentioned in my bio, my background is in robotics, and most recently, I've been doing a lot of work with unmanned aerial systems. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the work we've been doing in my research lab on enabling uh, ignitions from the air using small unmanned aerial vehicles. So really, our goal for this is to, uh, first and foremost, really increase the safety of prescribed fires. And I'll, I'll first tell you that all of you, I'm sure, know far more about prescribed fire and fire in general than I do. I'm a robotics person. Um, but I've been learning a lot about this, and and really it's great to be able to work with, with some of you and, and lots of other people who know a lot about this. So I apologize if I'm making any misstatements. Please correct me because I love to learn about this. But really our main goal here is to try to remove people from the interior of fires. So, so the... So this is a safety. This is a picture you see here of, you know, a, a fire we were at where, you know, they're using, using uh, just people in, in the interior to do these ignitions and really tough terrain. And so, so if we can get people out of the interior, we think that would be a great benefit to a whole host of, of the practitioners doing this. Also, uh, we know, you know, there are existing helicopters that can do aerial ignitions. Uh, but the cost really uh, makes those infeasible, and also availability. So they're they're you know hard to to get to get to come, and also very expensive. But we're also interested in trying to enhance um, the capabilities. So uh, we want to be able to both do traditional types of burns, but we're also working with some fire scientists who who think that maybe different types of ignition patterns may lead to better results for for the land. And of course, the focus of what I'll be talking about and what we've worked on is prescribed fires. But of course, we hope that at some point this could actually be used uh, for doing backburns in wildfire fire settings as well. Although there are a whole host of other issues issues there, given the the difficult trains that wildfires are often in. So, just to give you a, a quick status update, so. We have actually conducted two successful ignitions this this past spring, where we actually ignited um, ignited a couple of areas as part of larger prescribed fire efforts, and have done so with this this uh, autonomous vehicle, which is is small enough, really, you know, for uh, you know it's just a few pounds, so you can carry this out into the field easily, deploy it, and launch it. So today, what I want to start out by doing is really giving you a history of how this product developed. Also, a little bit of you know basically what we've um, done in terms of our field trials before getting into the design, and also at the end of the talk, I'll spend some time talking about some of the other projects that we have done in the lab that really made this possible, that that gave us the, the techniques and technologies that underlie this UAS FF as we call it. Um, they really come from the past past six or seven years of research we've been doing at the Nimbus Lab. And then finally, I'll, I'll end by talking about where we hope to go with this, and, and hopefully you know, a big part of that is getting, getting all of your input and information on you know, how, how the people out in the field doing this regularly and managing these types of groups actually could envision this technology being used. So first, how did we get started on this? Well, it turns out, and Bear with me. Let's see if I can get these these videos up. Um, so hopefully you can see this, and and this will play for you. It turns out that most of uh, you know this comes from actually when we were we're doing some work not on fire but on water sampling. So we had a USDA grant to actually try to develop a UAV, so an aerial robot that can actually go out and collect water samples. In part because while this is nothing as dangerous as you know setting fires, uh, definitely doing this type of water sampling can also be very challenging and sometimes dangerous. So back around 2013-2014, we had developed this UAV that could get really close to the water and collect water samples. So in this case, we're actually pumping water through a filter to collect 
uh, the villagers, the little um, little babies of zebra mussels, which are you know infesting many of, of the lakes in the U.S. and unfortunately, just in the past past few years, have now come to Nebraska, where I'm located. Uh, so, so we've developed this system that can go out and, and fly and collect collect these water samples. And in fact, we're actually working with a number of scientists on this. And one of the the people we were working with it was uh, Craig Allen. And Craig Allen here is um, actually with the Fish and Wildlife Unit in, in Nebraska leads that that unit. And and then my colleague Sebastian Elbaum that you see in the middle there, he was he's uh, one of my collaborators on this project and co-directs the Nimbus Lab. Well, we got together with uh, Direct Twidwell, who had recently been doing some work with Craig, and just had had lunch. We were just you know um, talking about about various things, and and this is really so out of this water sampling project, we started talking about fire and the challenges that 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 go along when you're trying to do prescribed fires. So with this, you know, Direct got really excited. Craig got excited about the potential of being able to do these ignitions from the air. Now Sebastian and I, our first response was, are you kidding? This is this sounds like a crazy idea. Because frankly, uh, at the time around 2014 was when the FAA was really cracking down on the use of drones uh, or UAVs, UA UASs. And you know, we were going through all the process of, of getting exemptions and waivers and, and things from the FAA. So we were saying, okay, there's no way we're going to be able to to you know, shoot fire off of a drone, at least legally. Um, but after a number of months, they they kept kept talking with us, kept telling us, you know, how how much of an impact this could have. And so a number of months later, we actually decided, okay, we should give this a try. And one of the things that actually convinced us that this might might be feasible is that, okay, we could do this without using a flame thrower, which was of course the first idea. And and that's when we, you know, Dirac was like, well, what, can we make these uh, PSD balls, these plastic sphere dispenser balls that are already used by commercial um, fire aviation groups to ignite these these fires? Can we can we adapt those to a small UAS to actually make this work? So we actually, in in less than a week, really most of a weekend, hacked together a prototype that could hold, you know, just six of these PSD balls. And we were able to actually successfully, successfully fly and do some, you know, drops and ignition. So, so this really got us excited and uh, and thinking that this might actually be a feasible project. So, after that, we really started to develop this further. So instead of hacking together something in a weekend that was all, you know, manually controlled and and hard to operate. We actually got a put together a team of, of students, so computer science, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, mostly graduate students, but also a couple of undergrads, and then went through a number of design iterations. So here you can see at the bottom uh, kind of the first three versions of, really it's really the, I guess the prior one should be version zero, um, but these are the first ones where we really invested a lot of time designing designing the mechanisms to actually be able to use these PSD balls because it turns out that one of the main challenges with with UAVs is flight time which is closely correlated to how much weight you're carrying. So if you have uh, put a lot of weight on it, it's not going to fly very long and in fact these have limited, limited payload. So this particular vehicle we're using can carry about a pound but not more. So a lot of the challenges were related to taking these you know, 50 to 100 pound PSD type dispensing systems and designing something in that with, you know, just half a pound to a pound can actually reliably inject and deliver these, these types of, of balls to ignite these fires. So the second prototype, we, we did a, a, num a fair amount of work on. And now let me show you a video of, of how this worked actually in the field, or not in the field, but in an indoor arena. And the reason why we're flying in this indoor arena is because we could light fires, fly our vehicles without having to uh, get the FAA to agree to this. So we did a lot of tested testing in this arena. Um, 
hopefully hopefully these videos are are playing okay for you and let's see that's slowing down a little for me so let's wait wait for a minute um, but really you know this was where we did a lot of this testing in this arena environment where we could go you know on a daily basis to actually actually go and test these and okay so let, I'll let this load for a second to see if, if it'll catch up but just you know again some of the the motivation here is really you know we want to try to help people who are doing these types of ignitions manually with drip to torches um, to, you know, while we don't see that this type of vehicle will eliminate the need to, to you know, do establish the perimeters of these fires, what we really are aiming for is to eliminate some of the interior ignition uh, challenges that, that people have. And, and of course, again, um, you know, this is, is definitely, okay, let's see, sorry for the the loading on the network. Um, there are, of course, you know, existing existing helicopters that can um, do this these types of interior ignitions. Um, of course, as I said before, uh, the cost associated with them is one of the the key drawbacks that we we see in this, and also, frankly, the danger to the pilots. So, I'm not sure if any of you are are uh, how many of you are fire aviation people. Um, or even more so anybody who's who flies one of these helicopters doing these ignitions I think that that must be an awesome job but you're also a little crazy to be flying right by those fires if I do say so myself um, but this is really where where we think we can use the type of technology we've been developing to to do better so let me just try to skip ahead in this video a little bit um, so a little bit of the, the design here, so of this first version. So here you can see how the ball actually can, you know, as we have a, a collection of these balls in the top, and then they can go down, they rotate into, into position where we actually can drive them on a needle, and that needle pierces these balls. It actually takes quite a bit of force to pierce these balls, in part because the balls are designed so that they won't, uh, you know, if they're stepped on, they're not going to break. Um, and then we inject it with the, the antifreeze that starts this chemical reaction. And then, you know, basically about after a minute, um, the uh, after injecting, it'll it'll catch fire. So this these t sets of set tests were really um, the thing that made us think, okay, it's possible. We can fly indoors. We can do these ignitions. We're you know we've we spent a lot of time developing the systems and mechanisms to actually do this, as well as the software to ensure that it operates properly. So at that point, we thought, okay, we can do. We think we can do this, but really, the the tests is is not so much about doing this indoors and in controlled environments, but really all the robotics we do in my lab. We really are intent on getting out into the field because we know. That there's just so much that you can learn when you go out into the field and figure out what it's really like out there. So we did a lot of tests indoor. We did a lot of, of revisions, you know, improving the needles for piercing. Uh, we ended up switching, you know, the brand of PSD balls to one that was more more uniform. We, you know, went through a couple of electronics control, electronics revisions, control software. But this was so our, we were doing those indoor trials. In uh, kind of 2015, uh, early 2015, and then really we started working on on getting um, getting outdoors. And it turned out that we needed to get a whole host of uh, people involved to get the right right permissions to fly. So first, University of Nebraska Lincoln, where I work. Uh, also around this time, the insurance companies were starting to say, "Okay, you have drones on campus. We want to uh, make sure that they're being." 
being used safe and they have the proper coverage. So we had to do a lot of work with UNL and, and UNL's insurance companies to you know, get approval for this. Uh, also the FAA, um, we have gotten all sorts of these COAs, these waivers for flying outdoors from the FAA for various projects. Uh, this one took, as you might expect, a lot longer just because it actually had to go through the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to um, basically get a waiver saying, okay, these are not, it's not a firearm that we're putting on this, that it's okay and safe to drop these. Um, and, and then we started actually working um, with the Park Service, in particular, in particular Homestead National Monument, which is nearby Nebraska, to try to set up a test there. And that then involved um, not only the Park Service, um, but the Department of the Interior, the Fire Aviation Group. Um, and I'm ha I, I like to tell people that we actually had to get our vehicle certified by NASA because the, the Department of the Interior subcontracts to NASA to actually verify flightworthiness. And really, without the help of a lot of the people in the Department of the Interior and the Park Service, who really helped push a lot of the, the paperwork through to make this possible, we wouldn't be where we are today. So big thanks to them. And, and with that, we were able to actually do uh, start on our first outdoor test where we were able to do ignition. So we've done lots of outdoor tests where we weren't doing ignitions, but the first ignition we did was in March of 2016. And this is, was a collaboration with the Lowe's Canyon Rangeland Alliance, which is a central Nebraska landowner group that does regular burns for, for some of their lands. And the area that ended up working out for us was a small part of a 2,000 acre burn. So they were doing a very, quite a large burn in this area. And a lot of the things they were targeting, as you can see in this, the picture on the left, is, is trying to burn these invasive cedars, which, um, which are a big problem in, in this area of Nebraska and, and well, throughout the Midwest, um, because they just take over the, the natural um, environment and also, you know, these is largely grazing land, which they they do not work well for. And this is a picture on the left of, of kind of the, these little canyons that are filled with these cedars. They actually had um, a year or two ago cut down the perimeter trees, stuffed them under the, the live trees to really be able to get up to the temperatures. And on the right, you see how they, they basically are handling this right now. And they burned all the grassland as well as part of this, this burn. Um, and I think it involved over 60 people doing, doing a whole lot of, a lot of work. And let me show you, see if this, this video will work for us, um, where, where we're actually doing this, this burn. And so this is the video of the first real prescribed fire conducted by an by a aerial vehicle. Um, the uh, unmanned aerial vehicle. And this gives you a sense of landscape. There are also lots of people around. Yes. All the people who are doing the burns who are really excited to Computer see this control. happen. And, All right. And so We're going down to this tree flying, about 70 meters. Okay. Flying uh, uh, 20 meters out. Yeah, about 70 meters out. And at this point, we're doing it fairly manually. So actually, right, 40 meters out. Um, being pretty conservative in how we're, how we're flying since this is the first time we're doing these, these types of ignitions. Um, but you can see, you know, the, the vehicle gets pretty far away pretty quick meters. and relatively small, small looking um, at a few hundred feet away. Now this is, rates, we're controlling it, but this meters. is actually autonomous in that the oh. We're good. We're telling it we're where good. to go, and it okay. goes positions, goes to the position right. where we want. And then, to the right of a, so you can see it all. You know, with you're good. a lot of smoke in the background. All right. And in a One. second, you'll see it actually zoomed in Dropping. to see. If you watch carefully, you'll see the the balls drop um, from the control station. You know, we have binoculars and can see see that they're dropping. But otherwise, it's very hard to see what's yep. what's happening there. Yep, and, right there. and then this right is there. now. Yep. Got it. Now, five minutes later, after there actually were ignition started by this, right there, so slow. Cut a little time, and You're you right. can see, you know, this is really good, good uh, dry tinder for for this. You know, this land the land was dry and yeah, really worked cool. out. Okay out well for these ignitions. So you yep. see we actually um, nice, nice started job. it in a couple spots.
and we're able to get the camera You're perfect really good, right there. Hold it. Good results with these Hold it. Hold it. Oh, beautiful. Hold it. Just one. So, so this was really our first first test that we did when we were were outdoors and let, let's see if I can get this off. Okay, and and really we learned a lot from this and we also consider this a, a good success largely because we learned a lot. So we flew, we were able to ignite three different canyons over, we did five flights, we dropped about 80 of the, the balls, and overall we were able to burn about 150 acres of, again, this 2,000 acre acre burn, and, and this was, you know, pretty successful. But we also really learned a lot. So some of the, the minor things we learned, you know, this was a, a a large burn unit, um, and the distances were really large for us, in part because of FAA restrictions on needing to maintain line of sight. We can't go more than you know a few hundred feet away, so definitely there we recognize some limitations of this type of system, where where at least in the near future, for FAA reasons, you're not going to be able to fly these a mile away to be able to do ignitions. Um, we also really experienced the hurry up and wait that is, uh, I'm told, very common with these types of prescribed fires, waiting for the right conditions. Um, so, you know, we were, we got out to the area we were, we were burning while waiting for the rest of the unit to be burned. You know, they thought, well, okay, this might be as soon as three or four hours. So we all got ready and six or seven hours later, we're still waiting. Um, by the time it got to where we needed to go, it was getting much closer to sunset. So once we needed to go, we really needed to go. And and our first flight out, you know, even though we had done all these tests, uh, we weren't sure whether the balls were being pierced and and properly to inject the fluid. So we ended up we ended up you know coming back, going testing things again, going out, and some more delays. It turned out that probably a lot of those ignitions were happening. It's just that the ignitions were slower than we expected, so we needed to, to wait five or six minutes to tell whether something actually happened. The other thing we, we realized in this is that we didn't need to carry, at this point we were carrying 40 or 50 of these of the PSDs per flight, but we really didn't need that many we, because one or two balls on target would cause an ignition. The final thing we, kind of minor thing we learned is that working with the bird boss uh, while, you know, having a map beforehand is useful, in the field it turns out it's a lot more about pointing. So it's about, okay, go over there, no, a little to the left, a little to the right. And, and that's really the effective way to, to control these. And then we have had, had some more major challenges where, uh, again, as I said, uh, we were having some problems puncturing the, the balls because they're difficult to puncture and we think probably one of the large, largest causes is just a lot of dust and dirt and wear on the, on the system caused, caused challenges puncturing. And actually the last one really it started the puncture but then jammed, couldn't, couldn't get out. Uh, so then we had to quickly uh, remove, remove that ball from the vehicle while, while we were in the field. And we decided at that point um, to, you know, after we had started these, these three fires to stop and not press our luck, luck further. So the the team of 60 people of these landowners went and finished off the fire. Um, but really great experience for us, and we learned a lot. And this led to the next revision of our of our system. And really, this was somewhat pressing because we had about a month before we had scheduled this time to do this ignition at Homestead National Monument. And um, and so we had about a one month time. And I see there's a question about are we using GPS planning to deliver the balls or is that the future? So we are using GPS to actually say where where to go. We're not using um, we a map overlay of the aerial footage in part because when we tried to do some of that, uh, there was enough discrepancy in you know how the landmarks kind of changed over time that it was difficult to do. Although I think there are some ways to actually advance that. So what we ended up with this third revision is the interface you see at the right, where it's really more of a, a radar pointing display where you can basically easily click on that display to say how far to go and at what angle. And you can also you know, easily jog left or right. 
Because at least at this point, we found that the people we've worked with are really doing much more of this pointing to, you know, go a little further, go left, right. So within this month, we actually, first we um, revamped our existing system, version 2, to get it, make sure it was up to speed and, and ready to go. But then we actually developed a, a new system that ended up, that we ended up, um, you know, testing sufficiently to be able to use in the field for, for our next field trial. Um, so let me show you a video of, of our experience at Homestead National Monument. And this was a very different burn in that really what we were doing <coughs> was the whole, this was a smaller 20 acre burn where we were really the focus of it. So, so a whole bunch of people came to help with this burn as they, and they burn this regularly. And, and so the whole crew that normally comes came but they were, they were basically, uh, the goal of this was to really test this type of system. So much, much easier area to work in, you know, relatively flat grasslands, easy to see, easy to, easy to access, safe. And so you can see, you know, here, just to give you a sense of kind of flying along, along the, the fire line there is the vehicle. Again, um, you know, you can, when you're zoomed in with the camera, you can see the, the ball is dropping, but from afar, the only way we know that it's dropping besides binoculars is the, the feedback that our software is giving. And also we have on board a camera now looking down. And if you watch closely, you can see the ball dropping from this right there. And, and we can also, you know, this gives us some status to know that it's actually, actually going where we want it to. So we can also see the, the target. And this is flying over the, the ignitions later. So you can see, you know, it, it, all of these ignited into little balls that, that grew out. And eventually after uh, five, or, five or ten minutes after, depending a lot depending on the winds, the, those, you know, balls closed into a line and did the backburns from the interior that, that really the, that was the goal. So, so we also consider this, you know, a successful successful test. We were very happy with the the performance and how well it worked. Um, we also, of course, learned a lot about this as well. So we burned over 20 acres in this, and on the right you can see the where the flight patterns and also where we dropped balls. So we were starting. So we were stationed along the right hand side and moving down to the the burn was basically going up from this location, so towards the top of your screen. So we tried some lines, we tried some <coughs> both horizontal and vertical, and and really, you know, this worked well, but we of course, um, you know, learned a lot about this as well. The system worked quite well. We had some radio communication issues on the first flight that we, uh, that we quickly resolved, but one of the things we really learned is that we need to be able to reload and relaunch much quicker and also get to new staging locations. So definitely, uh, in this case, the, the burn crew were, were very generous with their time and were, you know, letting, and the conditions were really perfect for this so that we could, we could wait while we took, you know, five minutes to reposition and relaunch. Um, but ideally, we would want to, you know, make this instant where we could just go sortie after sortie to, to start this. Also, <coughs> in this case, you know, if we could do drop more balls on, on this location, that would, that would be useful so we could do a full, full line across the field. Um, we, also, we also, you know, continue to recognize that our interface, while we are good at operating it, we really need to have an interface that the, that the burn boss can, can use and relate to. So lots of lessons learned. And so that's hopefully a little bit of a history of kind of how this project evolved. Um, what I want to talk about now is really the details of, or a little more details on the design of this third version, which is the, the version that we're currently working with. And at the moment, we don't have, have plans for major revisions, mainly much more minor revisions at the, at the moment. So one of the, the key things about the design, so this is a kind of close-up uh, computer rendering of, 
of the design, one of the key things that we need to do is, as I said before, keep things lightweight and easy to operate. So there are four key mechanisms here of this. So, and and these mechanisms have have evolved, you know, through the through the couple of years we've been working on this. Um, um, but all of the versions we've had these kind of four separate mechanisms. So the hopper where we're storing the balls, that's one area. The way we load the balls into the mechanism, and real key to this is actually how we pierce the balls, and then the way we inject the fluids. So looking at the loading mechanism, so on the, on the left here, and I'll try to use this little pointer, uh, so you can see we basically have, have a motor that can cont control two doors here, and this opens up the hatch, lets a ball come in from the loading area. And then on the other side here, you can see basically once it's in that loading area, we can use this piercing motor to and leveraging a lever arm here to really drive this ball onto the needle, which requires a significant amount of force to pierce and to pierce reliably. And if you've ever worked with PSDs, you know that there are these seams, you know, it can require more than twice the force to just puncture at a seam as in the side. So there's there, you know, we had to support being able to pierce the side and again while keeping the whole mechanism as lightweight as possible to make sure that the UAV could actually still carry it. <coughs> just a little more on the on the injection me mechanism here. So the injection mechanism basically at this point we have a, a reservoir of all of the of the antifreeze that we use that causes a chemical reaction within the PSD ball and in this version we actually uh, have have a little reservoir that's a syringe that's separated from from the needle so the needle is on the other side so the fluid travels through the, the tube here and that's separate from the earlier versions had had the syringe and needle all connected together. And then one feature on this third revision is just a really quick release handle here so that we can remove the whole device quickly. Uh, we hope that actually uh, in the future this will allow us to basically <coughs> excuse me, be reloading the mechanism or have a cartridge that you basically just pop on every time your vehicle comes back to improve the improve the reload time. This latest version we actually have have just 12 of the the balls that we can carry and and that was in part because of our first experience where we decided we didn't need as many. This in this last experience we think we you know could use more um, but you know some of the other things to consider when you're when you're flying a vehicle is that we also have to be concerned not only with weight, but the center of gravity. So, you know, this is all curved to be able to actually move the center of gravity over the center of the vehicle. And there's a question from Josh about making the release mechanism jettison capable and uh, by remote uh, in case that there is a fire. So, yes, that's a great idea. And actually, our our version two had actually an automated system where. Basically, there was a little thread that, if it burned, would drop the whole mechanism. In this version, uh, we could definitely add a servo, a motor, to actually release it remotely. Um, we did not test this, but our actual hope in this design is that if there was a stuck ball in there, that it would both melt through the bottom hatch door, which is then pretty easy to replace, but also you can see in this picture it's pretty offset from the vehicle so that if there is any problem we could actually be able to recover um, <clears throat> recover the vehicle and that it wouldn't cause problems where it was um, you know on fire and getting close to the vehicle the fire would hopefully be far enough removed and enough material in between that by the time you know it caught on fire it would both fall out by itself but also be far enough away from the vehicle to not damage the vehicle so let me show you just a, a video showing showing how how this works. <coughs> so here you can see kind of that attachment mechanism, and then this hatch opens up. 
and let the ball slide in. Once that happens, you can then, then there's that drive motor that will really puncture the ball onto the needle. And then we can inject a little bit of antifreeze. Really, we need about, um, about a milliliter or so uh, to cause, cause a proper ignition. And then, basically, the, that bottom hatch opens up and the ball can fall out. So that's the, the kind of design here. Now, really, okay, this was, we're, we're quite happy with the design. It was, you know, we had successful and safe, more importantly, ignitions at two different locations. And a uh, number of faculty involved, but the real people doing this were a number of these students. So, so Jim led the mechanical design, Chris, uh, electronics, uh, Evan worked on the software, and Becca worked on, on the sensors. So really, they're the ones who made this possible. But it's really a larger team effort. So the Nimbus Lab has a number of people in it and working on a number of projects. And um, I just wanted to describe a little bit, a couple of relevant projects. So I talked about water sampling before, and I just want to spend a minute talking about water sampling. And, and first, why are we doing water sampling? So uh, this is actually uh, the Fremont Lakes area near where I live in Nebraska. And these are all individual lakes. And yet they, this is the second largest recreation site in the state of Nebraska. And we needed to, and the water scientists we were working with um, were wanting to, basically they were having to put a boat in at each of these lakes and take it out to collect water samples. Um, so we came up with the idea of using a, drone to basically automate the current manual sampling as they as you can see in this picture um, and one of the key things is that we're using basically the same platform the base platform which is from this company called Descending Technologies uh, which is a German company and uh, I guess has a perfect name it's named Firefly is the type of vehicle um, and and basically for the aerial water sampler we were using again, adding a mechanism on there. Um, so the mechanism is totally different, but really a lot of the software that we developed for this vehicle is the same software that we use on, on the ignition system. And there's a question about uh, what time of flight time do we get out of this? So, so basically, this vehicle has a 15 to 20 minute flight time. And the 20 minutes is when you have no payload on it. Uh, it can carry a little over a pound, and when you have, have that, that weight on it, you have about a 15-minute flight time. Um, there are definitely other platforms that can carry more and have longer flight times that, that may be more relevant. <coughs> but a lot of the software, including how do you, you know, precisely control not only the position but altitude, a lot of the safety and the autonomy systems, and this isn't about uh, autonomously flying everywhere, but actually actually using um, the, you know, the ability to um, make smart decisions on its own uh, at kind of the lower level. Um, also, there's a question about using a rain dance capsule system. Yes, we have, have looked at that um, later on in the process, and that's definitely one of the things that we're, that we're thinking about. Another question is, is a pilot's license required to run the drone? Um, this, this is quickly changing. So, so currently, the rules are that you don't necessarily need a pilot's license, but you need to have gone through uh, ground school for this, for normal flight, uh, you know, air, become an airplane student pilot, basically. Um, now this is changing, so in August, there'll be a dedicated drone, um, uh, drone pilot's license, and, and that will be something that'll be hopefully much easier to, to do because uh, it'll be, you know, maybe a, a week or two of work. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're where we're at. So I think it'll be be easier. Um, so yeah, again, uh, a lot of the fundamentals here have really really worked their way into the system. And just to give you an idea, um, there are a number of subsystems here. Um, uh, you know, that I won't go into details, uh, but you know, we have have additional sensors like ultrasonic sensors to know how far we are off the water in this case. Also, 
In the case of the water sensor, we have conductivity sensors. So we know when we're in the water and also approximately how deep. And I'll skip this video because I showed a similar one earlier on showing that you know we're able to get really close to the water. We've done some interesting experiments with, with scientists, you know, not only collecting water samples, but actually being able to measure the temperature and measure the temperature down deep in the water at multiple multiple locations to get really an array of of temperature readings to figure out the gradients as you can see see in that picture. And okay. Normally when I'm when I'm talking about this I, I ask the audience who knows what this is. So if anybody wants to quickly type what this is, um, then then you can I don't know get extra points. Okay, I see a few people typing. Okay, it's a DJI Phantom. Yes, that's correct. And where is this crashed? Anybody quick? Okay, so this is actually a picture from a year or two ago in uh, a crash with DJI Phantom on the White House lawn. So, and I'll answer some of these questions at the end. So feel free to keep typing and I'll go back, back to them at, in a few minutes. But <coughs> failures are also really a big part of, of robotics and any flying system in particular. So here you can see Actually, this is where, in our water sampler system, a motor failed to start, which caused a crash into the water. Okay, so this is not what we want to happen. So a lot of the work that we're also working on in the Nimbus lab is related to actually improving the safety and autonomy of robot systems. And this is where, where we see a lot of the things that are under the hood that I haven't talked about, the, of this prescribed burn vehicle, really comes into play. So we're also looking at how you can, you know, detect and compensate for, you know, environmental hardware user and software failures. So I'll just show show one more one more video here, and and then we'll have some some time for for questions in just a minute. But basically, this is our lab environment where we develop a simple, well, it's fairly complex, but a landing system that allows the drone to land on a moving vehicle. And there's a lot of software software in here that goes under, underneath. And what we did is we analyzed what a good landing looked like on this moving platform. And then, basically when we added wind, for instance, in this case, the normal system would just crash and not work well. But the thing is that we could use the successful landings to actually develop a monitor that would know what actually the landing looks like to be able to compensate. So here, with this broken platform, without the monitor, it crashes. But with the monitor, it knows that something went wrong and will abort the landing and try again. So this allows us to get to nearly 90% success rate from something like 20 when with the monitor than without. And this is some of the things that we're working on, on in, the, in the lab that are also integrated into this type of system that are just really under the hood and that you don't don't see. So I'll skip I'll skip the approach, but I think the takeaway is my my hope hope for you is that there really there's a lot more that these UAVs or UASs can do than just fly high and observe observe. So certainly in the fire environment um, there are huge uses for UASs just to monitor the fire and figure out where it's going, monitor the, you know, even the atmospheric conditions. But I think that the UASs are really going to be even more disruptive than that when they start to really interact with the environment. So, you know, not only collecting water samples, but, you know, starting prescribed fires. And I think some of the challenges that are really public perception and regulation challenges um, but also I think there are some of these fundamental challenges in my field in robotics and how do you actually do this safely when you don't have a pilot on board. So moving forward, you know, we're really excited about this work. We're, um, we're hoping to, you know, continue doing some, some uh, targeted testing of the system to help us refine the design, integrate additional sensors that we can actually you know, detect that perhaps the user is trying to 
fly into an area that's too hot for the vehicle to fly and either notifying the, the operator or just flying around. Uh, and this is part of the interface testing. We're also looking, you know, for, for funding for this, not only for, for doing additional field tests, but also for uh, some more of this fundamental development that we think is necessary to make this a commercial product. And also, uh, of course, we're always interested in, in finding partners for this, this work. And there are a whole lot of people involved in this, not only from, from UNL, but the Lowe's Canyon Range, Rangeland Alliance, also Homestead National Monument. Uh, they've been really great to work with, Mark and Jesse there. Uh, National Parks System, Department of Interior, you know, the Forest Service, all of these people really made this possible. And I'm sure I've forgotten people. Um, but with that, I have one last question for everyone, which is, <coughs> who is who in this picture? So, okay, we're, we're the ones on the left with all the, un <laughs> the new gear. So, yeah, so a lot of people made this uh, made this possible yeah the burners are dirty that's for that's for sure so so my team uh, we're trying to get dirty um, but it'll take us a long time to catch up but we hope that the type of technology that we've been developing will be a tool that will be used used in the field with with much more regularity so with that I'll, I'll try to answer some of these questions and you can feel free to to type some more also I wanted to mention that there that will there is a survey that we're actually doing to try to understand some of the needs and requirements to help us refine the design. And it'll take a little time to fill out, but I definitely would encourage you, you to, if you can, spend some time doing that, as that'll help us. And we'll have that link um, up a little later. So let me get back to a couple of these questions. So, so I guess one of the, I think the pilot's license question was answered by somebody. Um, but I guess one of the questions Amanda asked is, we have digital weather station capabilities on, on this device. So that's one of the things we're working on. And so we can actually measure uh, the temperature in the air and also, based on some of the flight characteristics, estimate the wind speed at the altitude we're operating at. This is something that we're, we're hoping to continue to, to develop. Um, so Kevin asked, any plans to test the system in forest environments? This is um, I would love to. I think the, you know, talking to people about this, you know, some of the real challenges in forest environments are just the, the updrafts. Um, if you're, if you're flying above the canopy and the canopy is on fire, especially in wildfire type of situations, uh, we, we want to kind of start, start small and move forward. So, you know, we did some flights over the fire line at Homestead and, you know, and we need to kind of start to push the limits more to see where does the, the heat and turbulence start to impact the performance of the vehicle. Um, and then Dennis asked about a uh, line of sight question. So um, also forested ecosystems and, and Scott actually um, basically responded a little bit to this. So there, so from a engineering standpoint, it is possible to go beyond line of sight. Uh, from the FAA standpoint, uh, there you can get waivers to go beyond line of sights. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it would take a lot of work to con convince all the agencies involved um, to do this, at least in the near future. I think we'll have to demonstrate a number of in line of sight successes before you know being able to do this out of line of sight. But it's definitely definitely feasible from a technology perspective. And then Mindy asked regarding the PSD ignitions, uh, does the pilot control the pace timing of each ball drop? Uh, yes. So we can do two things. We can either have have the you know user actually manually dropping each time. Although how we did have done all these tests is basically setting up a, a spacing interval. So <coughs> I think at Homestead we use something like I think we were dropping every five or six meters is what we programmed the vehicle to do. So then once we say start, it'll go and drop as many as we, we told it to. Um, yes, and I guess Scott also said, 
uh, FWS officers offices need to work with the DOI Office of Aviation Services to start a UAS program. I completely agree with that and would love to be be part of this. Uh, Carrie asked about using dragging eggs that are smaller and lighter. Uh, we did actually, uh, we have, have a bunch of them. Um, the piercing is actually about the, about the same. Uh, we could carry more volume-wise, but the weight was not significantly less than the other ones. And it turns out that the weight of the balls was much less than the weight of everything else. Uh, Kevin asked about the maximum wind speeds that, that we can operate in. Uh, so the vehicle itself were, were pretty comfortable flying into like 15 mile per hour winds. Um, we can fly up to 25 mile per hour winds. We prefer to be in the, in the 10 mile per hour wind range. So at least for prescribed burns, we feel like this is pretty good. Different vehicles, larger larger vehicles can can tolerate faster winds. Um, okay, so Ken Ken asked, is there a system in place to upload a KML file of the fire brakes in a way to program the flight path to ensure no PSDs are dropped outside the fire brakes? So this was all done in a more manual way for these tests. So so we have our own software limits that say you know, you can only drop in, in these types of areas. I definitely think you're right. In the future, you know, this is something that could be automated so that you just upload the file and create a safe zone where, where it is safe to ignite and where it's not. Also, I think, you know, this is something where it could, you know, ideally be evolving over time and that, you know, you know, we, we think there's a lot of, a lot of potential to, you know, if the, if the firefighters all have, have a you know a device that's broadcasting their GPS position. We could even avoid you know dropping within X feet of a of a of the personnel out there. Um, Mindy asked the cost of the current version of the drone. Uh, that's a really good question. So we buy the ba base platform itself, and it's about uh, ten thousand dollars or so. Uh, in part, it's a kind of research grade vehicle. Um, there are similar ones that are less expensive. The stuff we add onto it, uh, it's hard to account for the, the labor because we don't we don't count that too much. The parts themselves are 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 not you know in the you know probably under a thousand dollars for sure, um, but that's not counting some a lot of the labor and development costs that that went into, into this. Um, and then Joe's asking, how is the size of the platform chosen? Uh, seems like a more powerful platform may help. This is definitely true. There are, are ones with higher payload, um, um, bigger, you know, longer range. Um, it's actually an interesting time for kind of the drone market. There's actually a number of federal agencies have recently come out saying that they do not allow DJI drones, which is the biggest producer of consumer drones, to fly on federal lands or, with, or, or as part of federal programs in part because it's a Chinese company and they're sending all of the waypoint information back to their servers in China to, um, to do that. So, but now DJI has put a lot of other drone companies out of business. So I think we'll have to see how, how the drone market evolves in terms of available platforms. But yeah, I think, I think this could definitely be something where, you know, that they could have a 40 minute flight time, could be able to do a mile of, of lines, you know that type of thing, um, but of course there's uh, there are some challenges challenges with doing that that as well, and and also we we at least think that there's some a lot of utility in keeping this small enough that it's easy to and portable portable to to be able to carry out. And Scott says the Army Corps of Engineers is using DJI products. I I think I'm there are a lot out there, and yeah, I guess there are some more comments on here on on who's using what. I think this is yeah changing changing uh, fairly quickly. So it's been great talking with all, all of right. you, and I think uh, David had some has some wrap up notes here. Yep. All right. Well, well, thanks so much, Carrick. A fantastic presentation today. Um, we're pretty much used up our hour. I want to add one last question to to wrap things up. Um, so 
given the limited payload uh, and the limited number of, of PSDs that, that they can carry, uh, what do you think about using more than one uh, UAV to as part of a, a team of igniters? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think uh, that's one of the things that I think could make a lot of sense. You know, I think our our vision, you know, our somewhat naive vision is that you know every firefighter will have a shovel and a drone, and you know maybe you can so then then you can be coordinating all of these. And there are a lot of interesting research problems on my side on how you would do that. But definitely, mm -hmm. I think that's one way to really scale up to larger landscapes and and you know larger larger systems. Yeah, I mean, I guess the analogy is, you know, if, if you're doing even a small burn, if you have one drip torch, you can you can do some things. But if you have more than one drip torch, even just on the ground, that opens up a whole a bunch of new possibilities for your burning. Yeah, exactly. so, I think that's, that's great. Thanks, David. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, thanks so much. It looks like we've, we've run up to the end of our time here.